And here we go. So we are here to talk about the Vex V5 Coding Studio. Uh, my name is Dean Jacks. I work for iDesign Solutions. I'm the in-house training expert, and I also do Canada sales and uh, North America for support. Uh, we've got our co-founders, Andy and Mario. Sarah's with us today. She is the head of our marketing department. And then depending on where you're based, you'll notice that we do have three reps, Scott, Brett, and Stephen, which have split up the United States and cover different states. They are excellent resources if you have any questions. And of course, you're always welcome to reach out to myself as well. So who is iDesign? What is iDesign? We are an educational reseller. So we focus on solutions for STEM products, for uh, schools and organizations, VEX is definitely our premier product. Uh, we're a reseller for them. And we also do have a line of 3D printers, laser cutters, software, uh, things like Sphero as well. So today's agenda, we're going to look at the V5 Blocks interface. We're going to talk about programming the brain. We're going to talk about uh, using motors, doing drivetrain programming. We're also going to dive into some sensor programming. And then at the end, we're going to talk about uh, the V5, the world of V5 and parts, the competition, and I'm going to save some time at the end for a Q&A. But anytime during the program please, or the, the webinar, please feel free to either type in the chat or just unmute and ask any questions you have. This webinar is all about you. So VexCode is a fantastic product because it is very simple, but it is always very powerful. Uh, it's based on Scratch, so it's something that a lot of students are already familiar with. And what's great about the VexCode solution is that it is the same. So regardless of which product line you're looking at, when you open VexCode, it's going to be the same interface, and a lot of the blocks are the same. Obviously, as you get to V5, we get more powerful solutions, more powerful blocks, but the interface is exactly the same. So students never need to learn about a new interface. If you're looking to download it, it's on the VEX uh, download page. And the one you want is the VEX code V5. I don't recommend the VEX code Pro unless you're really looking at teaching computer science. Uh, the VEX code V5 does block coding and also does text coding, which I'll show you, and is the great place to start. So again, it is a standalone program. So in Windows, you would download it and then you would access it. Uh, through a shortcut on your desktop or through the actual start menu. So it's not web based. You actually have to download it and have it installed on your school computers. So again, this is what it looks like when we first start it up. And we have three different sections here. And what I'm going to do now is I'm actually going to shop, stop sharing my screen because it is pretty boring to go through this in a PowerPoint tutorial. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to switch to the actual software and take you live through it, which is a much better way to explain it. So here we go. So this is VexCode V5. When you first open it up, this is exactly what it's going to look like. And I'll take you through the menu from left to right. So over on the left, we have a globe. And if we click on that, you'll notice that there are a number of different languages. This can be very powerful, especially if you've got students where maybe English is a second language, or if you're looking to give the students an extra challenge, maybe having them, uh, you know, work in French or Spanish, etc. Next, we have the file button. So this is where we're going to be able to load projects that we've been working on. This is where we're going to save our projects, which is important. And this is where we can start a new project. The other thing you'll notice is they have example programs. So there are quite a number of example programs here. And the idea with VexCode is that students should be able to learn on their own. So if they have a question, if they say, you know, how do I code? How do I make the robot change velocities? They can click on a, a a section of code like changing velocities and have some code that they can load right into their robot, test out, play with, and learn from. You'll also notice across the top that you can drill down. So you can do templates. And what a template is, a template is where they've set up the environment for the robot, but there's no code. And we'll talk about that in a minute. There's also things like motion, drivetrain, et cetera. So they can choose what they're looking to learn or work with load a sample program and learn that way. 
Uh, an even better way to learn is the tutorials button right next to that. And what these are is these are small videos that VEX has put together that explain things. So for instance, if you've got a team that needs to learn how to program moving the arm, they can click on this. You'll see that a video opens right in the software. They can make it full screen. A lot of students prefer to leave it minimized and actually follow along as it goes. And they can drag and drop the blocks to show uh, to follow along. And you'll notice that this is a very short video. Most of these videos are right around one minute long. So they're designed to help the students overcome an obstacle, show them exactly what they need to do really quick, really easy, and keep the students engaged and moving along. The next thing we have is the slots. So with the VEX V5 brain, we actually have eight different slots as they call it. And what that means is we can actually save eight separate programs on the V5 brain. So if you're doing a competition team, they can save eight different programs that they might use for different parts of the competition. Uh, or if you're working in the classroom, you can actually assign different slots to different classes or different groups if they're sharing robots. And it's as simple as assigning that. So now I'm going to be saving in slot two. And when I actually look on the robot brain on the touch screen, I can scroll through all the different slots and I will see that mine has been saved to slot two. I'm going to move it back to slot one because that is where I usually work. Next, we always need to name our project. Uh, very important. Otherwise, the students are going to end up with a whole bunch of projects all called VEX code project, which isn't going to help them when they need to find the code they need. And then over on the right here, we have the interface where we actually connect to the robot. So if I power my VEX V5 robot on, and I plug into the USB port, we get that nice little Windows sound. And you'll notice that my brain has change to an orange color. And this is actually great for us because it will change to an orange color if it needs an update. It will change to a green color if it's fully updated. So this is gonna check the firmware or the operating system of your VEX robot. Fortunately for us with this group, we just got a new update from VEX. And now I can show you how that works as well. So the first thing we need to do, we want to update it so that it's going to work reliably and it's going to work best with the software. So you can see that we've got a brain name that's it's just called VexB5. We can put a team number or if you're working in the classroom, you can uh, label your robots. Mine's blank, of course. And it tells us what version of Vex we're on. And there's an update button. So in the past, we actually had to use a standalone updater which means we had to download a separate program that only worked on Windows or Mac computers. And we had to uh, plug each robot in and check. VEX has fixed this. So now, as you can see, we can update right in the software. So it does take a little while, but if it looks like it's stuck, don't worry. It always goes to the end. We just got to wait for it. And you'll see the same indication on the actual robot. And it is writing to the robot right now. So it's that easy to update the firmware. And what's great about this is you're going to know when there's new firmware available automatically whenever you plug your robot into code. So once we've downloaded this, what it asks us to do is turn our robot brain off. And we do that just by holding down the power button. There we go. We can power it back on. And you'll notice now that the brain is the brain icon is now green, which means that we're up to date with the latest version of VexOS and we're ready to go. Uh, one of the features that I want to make sure everybody knows about, and I'm just going to switch cameras for that. I'll switch to the robot cam. There we go, is that we don't have to physically plug in the robot in order to do coding, because depending on where the robot brain is plugging, unplugging, plugging, unplugging, what we can actually do is we can take our VEX controller and we can plug that into our computer. And what you'll hear is you'll hear that it initializes. And now if we look at the software, it's going to tell us that 
the controller is connected and the brain is connected and the brain is up to date. So what we can actually do is just connect the controller. This works uh, very well because the cord is long enough that if I want, I can sit back here and still drive the robot around. Because it's hooked to the computer, the controller is charging. So your controller is always going to be fully charged. And we don't have to plug, unplug, plug, unplug. If I want to send code, I can just send it. And the VEX will use the radio uh, and the controller to send the code to the brain. So we're not actually programming the controller. We're still, still uh, programming the brain. We're just doing it remotely where we're not unplugging, plugging, unplugging. This also allows the students to leave the robot on the field or on the maze or whatever you've built for them so that they're not constantly bringing it back to the computer, plugging it in, or even worse, trying to balance a laptop near the field so they can keep plugging it in. Are there any questions at this point? I'm just gonna take a breather. It's now telling me I need to update the controller. So to do that, we just connect the controller to the robot using any one of the cables and it runs the update automatically. Sarah, are there any questions in the chat? No questions yet, Dean. All right, so now that we've covered the basics on how to get things started, the next thing we need to do, as I mentioned, is we need to set up our environment. So you'll notice when I scroll through these commands over here, I've got things like looks, events, control, sensing. I don't have any motors or drivetrains or sensors because we haven't told the software what we're connecting to or what type of a robot we've built. So to do that, we go to the device manager. And if we click on add a device, you'll see these are all the different devices that we can add. So we can program using a controller. Um, we have options for a drivetrain, which is what drives the robot, either a two motor or a four motor. We can program motors individually, or we can program motors as groups. We can add a vision sensor, optical sensor, inertia sensor, et cetera. Now, if you're working with your team or you're working in school where you've already pre-built a, a VEX robot, this is where cancel, we can use those templates. So I'm working here with the VEX Clawbot. So if I go to examples and I go to templates, you can see that I've got different options. And one of them is the Clawbot drivetrain, two motor, and in this case, I'm going to click no gyro because we do not have a gyro hooked up to this one. And what you'll see is it now automatically configures the devices, but we're still going to dive in and take a quick look and see what is done. So the drivetrain here, my left motor is on port one, my right motor is on port 10 because we followed the VEX directions. If we are using a gyro or an inertial sensor, we can click here, we can click inertial sensor and then tell it which port we've connected it to. If we're not using an inertial sensor, you'll notice that we need to make sure that this information about this robot is correct. So the wheel size, did we use the stock four inch VEX wheels or did we change to a larger or smaller wheel? What is our track width? And you'll see there's a little arrow here that shows you, you measure from the middle of the wheel to the middle of the wheel. Same with wheelbase uh, from the axle to the axle and what gear ratio we are running if we've added a gear ratio. So the reason the software needs all this information is if we're not using a gyro, what it needs to do is it needs to use some math to try to navigate turns. So when we use a code, a piece of code that you'll see on the left, uh, turn right for 90 degrees, it has no way to measure 90 degrees. So what it's got to do is it's got to use math. It's got to know how wide the robot is, what the wheelbase is, what's the gear ratio, et cetera, to be able to, to, to guess how far to turn the robot. And the reason I use the word guess is because it really does guess. If you're not using a gyro or inertia sensor, it's not going to be the exact same every time. And the way I explain this to my students is I say, stand up, close your eyes, now turn 90 degrees to the left. They're going to get close, but it's not going to be exactly 90 degrees, where if I were to give them a compass or allow them to keep their eyes open and use sensory input and say turn 90 degrees to the left, they should be able to turn accurately and to the same degree every time. So regardless of whether you're working in the classroom or whether you're running a team, I highly recommend the inertial sensors. They're not very expensive. And the reason they don't come in the kits is simply that they weren't ready when VEX released the kits. 
So none of the kits ever came with them because they were released afterwards. So they do have to be purchased separately. Um, when we set up motors, what's great is we can actually name a motor. So if you just click on a motor, if we were just adding a device and we click on a motor, you'll see it just called motor. When we click on a port, it'll change it to motor five, meaning there's a motor plugged in to port five. But what we can do is we can name that motor anything we want. So we can name it claw motor. We can also come in here and type anything we want. So in this case, because we are working on a claw, claws don't go forward or backwards. They don't go up or down. They open and they close. Should be a small C. All right. We can also tell it what gear cartridge we have because that's going to affect our commands as well when we start commanding the motor. And we can reverse the direction of it if close is in the wrong way, etc. Same for arm motor. We can name it as arm motor. Again, an arm motor doesn't go forward or reverse. It goes up or down. So it's really important to get your students to take the time and set this up properly so that they've named things properly. Because as you'll notice, when we start pulling commands out, we now can see spin the arm motor or spin the claw motor. If you're trying to help them or understand what they're doing and they've named everything correctly, we can now see this. they're spinning the arm motor up or they're spinning the claw motor closed or open. So now it's in a language that it's easy for them to understand, easy for us to understand, and it's gonna give them a lot higher success and allow you to be able to help them out. Are there any questions at this point? I'm just gonna grab a drink of water. And there's no questions in the chat, Dean. Okay, so I am just going to change screens once more. It's really important once students start building custom robots, where did it go? Oh, here we go. Just need to share a screen again. Bear with me, I seem to have lost my screen where I can share. It is gone. There we go. Okay. Where was I? Yes. So if students are building a custom robot, this is a great sheet and we'll send you a copy of it to have handy. Because what students need to do as they build their robot is they need to keep track of what they plug in where for when they start coding. Because they're gonna need to set up devices. So they're gonna need to know that maybe their left motor's plugged into one, their right motor's plugged into 10, their arm is plugged into eight, and their claws plugged into three. So this is a great sheet that gives them all of the ports on the brain, the 20 normal ports, the uh, eight legacy ports, as well as port 21, which most people tend to use for the radio. So while they're building their robot, if they have this sheet, once they get to coding, they're not going to be sitting there trying to chase wires through or having problems that things don't work because they don't know where it's plugged in. So back into coding. Here we go. So how do we get started? So what I recommend when working with students, so if we're talking about this robot here, and say we give them a simple challenge where they're going to take these VEX cubes and we want them to start stacking cubes. Rather than programming the robot to drive around first, I like to get them to start coding the robot to manipulate objects. So in this case, the first thing I would want to do is I would want the robot to be able to grab cubes. So the claw would close and grab a cube. One of the great things about starting this way is that while the robot is sitting here, the battery has a port where we can actually plug it in. So while they're still doing this testing, they're not draining the battery because a lot of these VEX V5 kits only have the one battery. So what it allows, let me just get cord out here. It allows us to take this robot, plug the battery in, so that the battery is charging while we're working on it. We just have to keep that cord out of the way and they're gonna have a fully charged battery once they get this robot ready to start driving around the field. So we have two different options for moving this claw. 
we can do spin claw motor, close for 90 degrees, or we can do spin claw motor to position. So the way this works is if we spin the claw motor closed for 90 degrees, and by the way, once we put some code together to, to run that code and test that code, let me turn this robot so you can see it a little better, through the back of it. It's as simple as clicking the download button. I'm gonna rename this because I started over. There we go. Because this second piece of code isn't connected, it's just going to ignore it. So you'll see now that it has taken it, it's compiled it, it's changed it into a language the robot understands. And when we want to run it, we can actually run it directly from this screen by pressing the run button. And keep in mind, I'm only plugged into the controller, so I'm not actually plugged into the robot. So now I can click run, and you'll see that the claw does in fact close. So this brings me to my next segue. When students start coding a robot, before they start, they have to figure out their starting position. And what I mean by that is they have an option. They can have the claw closed. They can have the claw open. They can have the arm up. They can have the arm down. As long as they start with it in that same position every single time. Because the robot does not remember where it is. The way it does is when we start the program, wherever the motors are, that position becomes zero. Which brings me to my next segue. If we use spin claw motor closed for 90 degrees, and now we want to open that back up, we would need to use spin claw motor open for 90 degrees. And if we decided we needed to close it a little bit more to grab the cube, 110, when we wanted to open it, we would now have to know, oh, it's open 110, so we need to close it 110. That is a difficult uh, way to code the robot because every time you make changes you're gonna have to make changes throughout your entire code so this is called relative relative to the position of where the claw is we can use to position so this here says move the claw motor to position 90 degrees it doesn't care where it is it doesn't care if it's open closed what position it's at it's going to spin it to position 90 degrees to close it, or sorry, to open it again, we are going to spin it to zero degrees because zero is actually where our starting point is. So I'm just going to put a little weight in between this. I'm going to wait two seconds. We're going to attach all of this. Download. And now I am going to run it. So you'll see it closes and then it opens again. So what I recommend when you're getting your students started is get all of this stuff done on the, the desk or the workbench ahead of time so that that way, perfect, your students can spend more time when they actually get to the field or whatever challenge you're giving them working on the drive code, which we'll get to in a second. So just to illustrate this, I'm going to go to motion. I am going to spin the arm motor. We're going to go 360 degrees. Now, remember, when we talk 360 degrees, we're not talking about the actual position of the arm. We're talking about how far the motor turns. So in this case, you'll have to take my word for it, but we've got a 12 tooth gear running on an 86 tooth gear. So when we hit the download button and run it, you'll see that it grabs the cube, the arm lifts up, and it releases the cube. So this is the type of coding you want your students to get started with, making sure that all of the functions of their robot work. Once they've got this done, now they know all of these values. So what they can do is they can take this code, they can put it off to the side, um, there are some other things we can do using my blocks and things like that, which we'll get to a little bit later. Now they're ready to start coding their robot to drive around. And as you'll see, because we've set this up as a drivetrain, we actually have some drive commands. So we've got drive forward, or we've got drive forward, and we can change this from millimeters to inches, for a set distance. So drive forward tells the robot, 
drive forward. And that's exactly what it's going to do. It's just going to drive forward and drive forward and drive forward. So when we're coding uh, for most challenges, what we want to do is we want to tell it how far. So if I say drive forward for four inches, we download this code. We run it, you'll see that the robot now drives forward four inches. Same for, we can add turn right 90 degrees. Let's download it again. And run. So now we've got a robot. Now, as you can see there, this was what I was saying about not using a gyro. So what happened is the robot hit the wall. It thinks it's turned 90 degrees, but it did not. So we're just going to stop this, pull it out from the wall a little bit, run it again. Now it turns the proper 90 degrees. So again, using a gyro sensor or inertia sensor, as Vex calls it, is really crucial, whether it's classroom or competition, to make sure that the robot is going to be consistent in what it does. Are there any questions at this point? Nothing in the chat, Dean. All right, so now we're gonna move to sensors. So as you can see, we can add a number of different sensors. We've got vision sensor, optical, the inertia you can, uh, you can usually add as part of the drivetrain and then you don't actually need to code it. When you tell the robot to turn 90 degrees, it will automatically use that sensor. There's the optical sensor, the electromagnet, et cetera. Uh, new, if you're wondering, is this new GPS sensor? Now that doesn't stand for global positioning, much like the ones in our car or in our phone. It's actually game position sensor. And that relies on having a pattern around the actual VEX field. And then the GPS sensor reads that pattern and is able to determine where on the field it is. That's a brand new sensor. I've not got to play with it yet. Uh, but that is something new if you really want to take coding to the next level, or if you're working on teaching your students uh, how self-driving cars work and things like that. And uh, last but not least, there's also the distance sensor. Uh, the easiest way for me to show you these sensors and actually for you to teach them is using the VexCode VR platform. So I'm going to switch to that. And VR, there we go. So for those of you not familiar with this, this is a website, vr.vex.com. It's 100% free. It can be used by any device with a browser, no logins, no sign-ins. So all your students have access to this. And the reason it's called VexCode VR is what we actually get is a virtual robot. And we'll just wait for it to load. So this is the playground as VEX calls them. This is one called grid map. And what we have is we have a little VEX VR robot. And it's got a lot of the same features as the VR. It's got a forward facing distance sensor, a forward facing eye, it's got a down eye. It does have an electromagnet that you can pick up virtual metal discs and move them around. It's got bumper switches. It also has a gyro location sensor, and it also has a pen. So what's great about this is it can also be used for steam or just for tracing the path of the robot. And just like the VEX V5, it's very simple to use. So I can say drive forward for 200 millimeters, turn right, drive forward. And as soon as I hit run, you'll notice my robot is off and running. So this is a great way to get your students started with coding, especially if you don't have enough robots for each one of your students. But we came here to learn about sensors. So let's dive into sensors. So the first sensor I'm gonna use is the distance sensor. So I can say, actually, I'm gonna cheat. I'm gonna use the bumper sensor first. So if I put the command drive forward and I click run, what's gonna happen is this robot Unlike our students, this robot listens really, really well. And we've told it to drive forward and it will drive and drive and drive until it can't drive anymore. And it's gonna keep trying to drive till eventually it works its way up the wall and gets stuck. The easiest command to use and coding, there's no right way or wrong way, but I always try to teach the easiest way. So the easiest way to use sensors is if we go to control, my favorite block is this wait until. And it doesn't mean that the robot waits until, it means that the code is gonna wait until. So wait until, I'm gonna to go to sensing and I'm gonna click left bumper switch pressed. So wait until the bumper switch gets pressed and then stop driving. 
We're going to reset. Off goes our robot. I'm going to shrink this down a bit so we can see. And you can actually see bumper, left, false, right, false. Ah, when it hits the wall, the bumper changes to true. So robots don't speak in yes or no. They speak in true or false, and it's called a condition. So our block says, wait until this condition becomes true. And in this case, that condition is left bumper is pressed. And as you can see, the wheels have stopped spinning. So we can just use commands like that. Wait until, so get something moving, wait until this happens. And then in this case, stop driving. Okay, we can use this for almost all of the sensors. So I can actually now say front eye is near an object. So if we run this again, what you'll notice now is the robot will actually stop before it hits the wall. You'll notice that our front eye object true, it now sees, yes, there is something in front of us, color none because it's a white object. If it was a, a cube that was red or green or blue, it would tell us what color it is. And the robot will now stop before it hits something. If we want to be able to adjust that so we now know where the robot stops, we can use the distance sensor. But you'll notice the distance sensor, distance in millimeters, or we can change it to inches, is a different shape. It will not fit in here. And that's because we need an operator. We can't just say, wait until distance. What we need is we need to go to operators, which are green. And what we can do is we can put this in, build this together. And this is what I meant when I said that this is a very simple system, but it's also very powerful that you can start putting little bits of code together to make more powerful commands. So wait until the distance in inches is less than four inches. Stop driving. So now we're going to take a look. Robot's going to drive. We'll change cameras again. And the robot stops four inches before it gets to the end. To make sure this is working, let's change it to 14. And what you'll see now is that the robot stops much further back. So now we can actually adjust where the robot stops using sensors. So this type of coding works for all of the different sensors. Whether it's a distance sensor, whether it's a color sensor, you know, you can say, wait until front eye, or in this case, we've got a down eye. So wait till the color sensor detects red, and that will work as well. So you can use uh, all of the sensing with the wait until. It's a very easy way to do it. Are there any questions at this point about the VexCode VR, about sensors, about the wait until block? about anything. Nothing in the chat either, Dean. All right. OK. While we're in the subject of VR, just in case you're not familiar with it, is a lot of coaches and a lot of teachers have started using the VEX VR before they actually get the students working with the robot. And the main reason for that is once they've got the robot in front of them, they're fiddling with it, they're tinkering with it, they want to make changes. Whereas when they're working with VEX VR, all they've got is a robot in front of them they cannot modify. So they're a little bit more focused. The playground does have a number of different, uh, sorry, yes, the play, there are a number of different playgrounds. Uh, one great one to start with if you want to teach your students to get the robot to the right place is the wall maze. What we have here, let me expand this, is basically a three-dimensional maze with solid walls that the students need to be able to code the robot to work its way through the maze. There's letters and numbers here as well, so you can make it a little more challenging and say, okay, I want your robot to go to the number one, the letter C, and then the finish line, et cetera. So you can change the challenge up. You can also... Um, if students get through it too quickly, you can give them that extra challenge while the rest of the class is still working through it. I did mention that there are metallic discs. Uh, sorry, in this one, the disc maze, what they are is they're actually discs where students learn to use the color sensor. And if we look at the pattern here, you'll notice that if they want to work their way through this maze, when they see a green disc, they want to turn right, a blue disc, they want to turn left, and then a red disc, they want to stop. Uh, this is the one disc mover. So these are metallic discs where students are encouraged to manipulate objects in the way of going and getting them and picking them up. 
So in this case, I'll do this very quickly, very simply. I'm gonna drive forward for 800 millimeters. We are going to energize the magnet. I'm not gonna bother turning the robot around and we're gonna drive back to where we started. So this is a great way to teach students how to use manipulators. You'll see that it's picked up that disc and now it's brought it back to the start. So I usually use Disc Mover as a tutorial to teach them how uh, to use the magnet and the drive codes, turn left, turn right. And then as a challenge, you can give them Disc Transport where this is more like a VEX challenge where they actually have a castle with a wall around it. And you, as you can see, the discs aren't laid out neatly in front of the blocks. They've got to go and whether they use the sensors to figure out what color uh, disc they've picked up or whether they just code it. It's a great exercise for them to learn to get the robot to the right place, manipulate an object and get back to the proper place. Uh, one of the favorites of most of the students is Castle Crasher. And just like the name sounds, they actually get to knock things over, crash the castle. So the idea here is that students can actually knock objects over. You'll notice that this uh, is the one playground where there's actually no wall around the edge. So what they can actually do is push objects right off the edge. The danger of course being that there's nothing stopping your robot from going over the edge as well, but there is a red border so students can learn to write algorithms using sensors to make sure that the robot does not drive off the edge. So are there any questions about VexCode VR before we go back to the Vex V5? Nothing in chat either. All right, either everybody's asleep or I might be doing an okay job. All right, so back to V5. Here we go. Okay, so a couple more things. Um, the reason I mentioned about just using the VEX code V5 and not the VEX Pro is because this does have a text option as well. But what's great about this is there is a code viewer. And as you can see here, it's live. So what's happening is as I'm adding blocks, this code automatically updates. So this gives students an availability or the ability to be able to see what their block coding looks like in text coding. So it's a very easy way for them to transition. You'll see down at the bottom, I can actually change between C++ and Python. So depending on which one you want them working in, you have that option. You can also convert to a complete text project using the exact same software, but and I don't have to mention this nearly as forcefully as I used to because the last update, they actually put this in to let people know. It says once you convert to a text project, you cannot convert back. So they cannot flop back and forth. Once they go text, they need to stay there. So what I always recommend, file, save your block code. And that way, if you go over to text and it's a little too overwhelming or you get stuck, you can at least go back to your block code. But you can convert to a text project. Now, there is also a help menu here, which is great because we don't expect teachers to know what every single one of these commands does. So for instance, set drive velocity. If I open the help menu and click on that block, it will tell us about what that block does and it'll tell us the limitations. So in this case, I get students saying, can I set the drive velocity, which is the speed the robot's going to drive to a million percent or a thousand percent? Let's open up the help and it'll tell you that it only reports a range from minus 100 to 100. So in this case, 100 is full speed. And that works for every single one of these blocks. When we convert to a text project, we still get a lot of the functionality. So I can actually still drag and drop. I don't have to type. I do have the option if I want, I can type and it is predictive. So I click on it, dot, spin direction, reverse, but it doesn't finish it up. You've still got to know where to put brackets, et cetera. And again, you can convert to a text project uh, in Python or in C++. So we do still have the functionality of all the drag and drop, plus the students can type. There is nothing that the students can do in 
the text that they cannot do in the blocks. So don't feel that you have to push them into this, but it is a great option uh, depending on you know, what level the students are at that you're working with. We have to remember that some students going into grade nine may have been coding since grade one or grade three, and some students have never been exposed to coding. So obviously VEX has tried to engineer this, that it will appeal to everyone. There is also the question marks here, which is the help menu. So for any one of these commands, you can click on the question mark. And again, it will open up a tutorial. It'll talk about how the code works and it will give you an example of how it looks, which you can, of course, copy and paste if you choose to, or you can just drag and drop from the menu. Are there any questions about the text coding with VEX code V5. Doesn't look like there's anything, Dean. All right. So now we are going to get to my favorite part. A lot of people think that the coding is only for the autonomous portion of the challenge uh, or of the classroom activity. But what's great about VEX is you can actually do hybrid programming. And I'm going to explain what I mean by that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to cheat and I'm going to grab a template rather than going through. So I got a drivetrain two motor no gyro. So this is what my robot is. And now I'm going to add a controller. So now what I'm doing is I'm writing code where the students are going to be able to, or myself, drive the robot around, but I can also do presets or subroutines. So the first thing I need to do is pick what driving style do I want? Do I want all the control on the left, all the control on the right? This is my personal favorite. The left joystick works like a gas and a brake, and the right joystick is for steering. I find that I, using this, the robot is easiest for me to drive. Of course, there is also the tank drive where each side of the joystick controls one side of the robot. So I'm going to go back to that. Now I can choose my default for what buttons I want to control what. So in this case, I can toggle through. I can put the arm motor up and down on the left side, and you can reverse these. You'll notice I can change down and up. And then on the right side, I'm going to put the claw. You can, of course, click if you leave on any of the buttons here and choose which ones you want to work. So for right away, they can configure this joystick the way they want. So now when I run this code, I've got code where I can drive this robot around normally just the same way it did when I first built it using the preset VEX coding. But what I can do now is I can start to add presets. So I can do things like when controller one button, which button am I going to use? I'm going to use the right button. When it's pressed, what do I want to do? So if you remember when we first started, we were spinning the claw motor to 90 degrees. That was going to grab onto that cube. And we can spin the arm motor to 360. So if I set my robot up here, I put my cube in place. I download this code. and I click run, when I click run, nothing happens because I now have full control. So if I use the controller, yeah, you can see the robot in the back moving around. But what's really great about this is, as I mentioned, I can do presets. So right now I'm gonna hit the right button right here. I'm just gonna hit one button. And it didn't quite pick up the cube, but that's okay. But you get the idea is now I can actually program presets on my controller that will run a subroutine. Try that again just to see if it's going to work. Needs a little adjustment. But what you understand is now we can actually set up presets with these buttons to do a certain task, um, whether it's pick up an object, stack an object on top of it, something, or if the students have built some sort of custom mechanism, they can actually have buttons where they're not controlling it manually. Because those of you that have actually worked with the V5, one of the complaints is it's really difficult 
to control the arms because they're they're jerky. So a lot of the times you'll see that the students will you know tap on the buttons trying to get it to the right spot. So this gives them an opportunity to actually build uh, the same type of code they would use in autonomous but build subroutines where they can set certain buttons on the joystick to do a certain function. Uh, a lot of the times uh, I'll get my students to code it where the claw motor will close, it'll pick it up. Um, if it's a part of the code where they're going to be placing an object, I always get them to code it so it places the object, opens the claw, or opens the mechanism, and then the robot backs up straight because students have a habit of trying to turn right away and knocking over what they've already done. So there is the option here to be able to add, and as you can see, uh, you've got all the different buttons on the controller that they can use, and you can have pressed or released so they can actually have different buttons to do different things. Another way this works really well is let's use the up button. And what you can actually do is you can actually have like a low gear for your robot. So what I'll have my students do is when controller one button up is pressed, set drive velocity to 50%. When controller button one up is released, set drive velocity to 100%, which means when they're driving around normally, this robot is going to go at 100%. When they hold down that up button and drive the robot around, the robot's actually going to drive at 50%. So it's much easier for them to control if they're in a situation where they need uh, fine tuning for their driving where they need the robot to move a little bit slower and be more concise. So the controller with coding really gives them what I first hybrid coding where yes, they're still driving the robot, but this will give them assists. Any questions about that? Nothing in the chat either. Okay, so I'm going to jump into the PowerPoint quickly again. Just to finish it up, it will go through all the coding stuff that we've done. We can talk about the feedback of the sensors quickly. So again, the V5 smart motors have built in encoders, which means what they have is they actually have a circuit board built into them where they actually give us feedback. So these aren't just motors, they're motors with built in sensors and they can tell us is the arm motor moving, what position it's at, and even things like how many currents in amps, how much current in amps, or how much power in watts, or how much torque the motor is actually putting out, as well as the efficiency and the temperature. So we can see if a motor is overheating, etc. There is the V5 inertia sensor that I talked about. Again, this is a sensor that tells us our heading in degrees, but it also works as an accelerometer. So it can actually tell us if we've crashed into items, et cetera. Very powerful sensor. The vision sensor, which I didn't get in today, that takes quite a while to go through. Um, basically what it does is it's a camera that will track objects. It tracks objects by the color, very easy to set up, but especially if you're teaching things uh, like self-driving cars, et cetera, or, you know, how the Amazon robots work in the warehouse, how they can, you know, keep track of different objects. Great sensor for that. I should also mention, I do this in the hardware overview, but all of the legacy sensor or the older sensors or three wire sensors do work with the VEX robot as well with the V5. They're under three wire devices, and you'll see that there is a list of them that will come up. So this is the VEX code text interface. So this is the VEX code pro, as they call it now. This is uh, modeled after uh, like a Microsoft uh, coding environment for C++. Very, very complex, very little in the way of tutorials. So this is something where if you're really focusing on using uh, C++ language and you want to teach your students proper coding, it's a great resource. Uh, if you're doing a robot for competition, again, the VEX code is much more powerful and much easier to use, just the regular V5. We're going to go over the world of the VEX V5 pieces very quickly. Again, we've got plates and bars, McKenna wheels, uh, no Omni wheels here. There's different types of wheels. So these are McKenna wheels. They allow the robot to walk to do basically a crab walk where not only forward and back and turning, but it can go sideways. 
There's different types of nuts, chains and sprockets, tank treads, which you can use to make intake systems, uh, linear motion kits, which are basically sliders, almost like a drawer in your house. Uh, and we get to the VEX competition. So this year's VEX competition is tipping point. Uh, if you are competing, the game kits are available. And this year is going back to in-person events. Uh, hopefully we'll be able to uh, keep the season rolling. Uh, and again, uh, for competition teams, the goal is always to get to VEX Worlds, which is the largest robotics competition in the world. And we made it. We are now at the question and answer session. So again, welcome to type into the chat or just ask questions about anything that I covered or anything I didn't cover. And I'm more than happy to answer those questions. Um, could you go over a little bit on the inertia sensor, like how to set that up for the kids? Um, we've had an issue with, it seems to work better when it's in a vertical position versus a horizontal position. Is Are we doing something wrong when we're coding that? Uh, it is possible. Yeah, let me dive back into that. Are you coding it uh, separately would, would be my question. Uh, or uh, you... Yes, they're coding it separately. Ah, okay. So the easiest way to do it is actually to add it into the drivetrain. So if they, if you add the inertial sensor in the drivetrain and say I've got it on port four, I don't actually have to code the inertial sensor at all. It will automatically now measure my turn. So if I do turn right for 90 degrees, you'll notice under drivetrain, it no longer asks what my wheelbase is or my, my track. It doesn't care anymore because it says, no, we've got an inertia sensor. So every time we turn, we're actually going to use the inertial sensor and measure how far it's turning. Okay. If, if you're using the inertial sensor separately, what the students need to understand is which access they're using. So let me just scroll to it here. So inertial sensing, uh, acceleration, uh, heading in degrees. Um, this should work best with the sensor mounted flat, uh, so the bolt going through from top to bottom. Okay. All right. But again, it's are you doing this in the classroom or for competition? Competition. For competition. So most of the teams are just using it as part of the drivetrain. Again, turn right for 90 degrees and the robot will actually use it and measure. And if it goes too far, it'll actually correct and move back a little bit. So it is a much uh, more accurate way to use it. And we don't have to do any extra coding. Oh, okay. Thank you. No problem. Are there any other questions? Uh, the one thing I didn't mention, which I should have, is when using the gyro sensor, you always want to calibrate it. And usually VEX recommends uh, a three second wait. So calibrate your inertial sensor, wait three seconds so it has time to fully calibrate and then begin your code so that it has a chance uh, basically to set itself up and make sure that it's going to work accurately. So if there's no more questions, that is the end of our session. Uh, I'd like to mention that I am always available for support questions and whether it's about a coding problem or, or uh, an issue like you were having with the inertia, always feel free to reach out to me. Uh, if I don't have the answer, I do have a pipeline to VEX where I can get a hold of them and get us some answers. So again, you're always welcome to reach out with whatever issues or, or questions you have, and I will try to help. Thanks, Dean. Appreciate uh, your time today. No problem. So again, thank you everyone for coming out to this webinar and we did record it. So you will get a copy of that. That way I know I went really fast through some parts, but you'll be able to slow me down or play me in slow motion or just be able to rewind or pause. So thanks everyone for coming out and have yourself a great day.